there guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to another Satanic Panic video. And this time I'm wanting to have a look at this. A Christian response to Dungeons and Dragons, the Catechism of the New Age. Well, first of all, I had to look up what Catechism was and how to pronounce it, because I had no idea. I'd never heard the word before. Apparently, that is how you pronounce it. And it means a Christian question and answer. So that's what this booklet's aiming to be. A response, a catechism, as you will to what Christians should think about Dungeons and Dragons. Now, it's written by P Peter Lightheart and George Grant, who are evangelists, you know, stand up on st uh, stage and preach the gospel. Um, so we are getting a very Christian view. These aren't aiming to be at all balanced, even though they try and phrase it as if they're thinking about these things. Now, first of all, as well as how to pronounce catechism, I have to compliment the cover. This looks like a really nice booklet. Um, it's only 24 pages long, but it looks like it could be a glossy book. Um, it's very nice uh, topography on there, and I really like the image. The dragon catching, catching kids in its claws. Very evocative. Nicely done. Obviously, I'm against what this is preaching, but I appreciate nice work when it's done. Inside, Christian Response to Dungeons and Dragons, other books by the authors... Um, a printing page dedicated to their children special thanks all rights reserved written permission must be secured from the publisher to use or reproduce any part of this book whoops but that seems a little odd in I'm preaching to people and trying to get them to believe something but you're not allowed to use what I've got I've got to sell it to you you need to get permission it seems a bit strange to me but that's probably just the way copyright works Perhaps you have to phrase it in exactly that way. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, I really do like the way this book's laid out and talks. Um, it's totally wrong in a number of places, but it's well written. The authors are beyond the standard of everything we've looked at in the past. These are really smart guys who know how to sell their ideas. So... Our parents are concerned, and well we should be. Our children are growing up in a very hazardous world. Not only are they forced to pick their way through a complex maze of conflicting values at school, in the neighbourhood, and out in the marketplace, but they are being assaulted in the safety of their own homes. Across the airwaves has come a barrage of violent, irreverent, fantastic and occultic Saturday morning cartoons. Out of the toy box has come a haunting phalanx of magical and monstrous macho images. Off the bookshelf has come a frightening parade of pulp and pap. Comics and paperback books that exalt the basest of vices and disdain the highest of virtues. And then, of course, there is MTV, sex, drugs, violence, rebellion, and defilement on top of, on tap 24 hours a day, all at the flick of a switch and the turn of a dial. See, great language. MTV, oh, uh, terrible rock and roll music. This is peak satanic panic. Um, even though, if we go back a couple of pages, we can see this was published 1987. So it seems very late. This feels well into the modern era. Um, I was working a job by this point. <laughs> but um, the seductive siren songs of the world has begun to seep into even the most protective environments. As a result, the hearts and minds and souls of our children have become a battleground. Amazingly, though, the chief weapon used in the spiritual raid on our children is a game. Just a simple little game. Now, we'll point out they're saying it's a simple little game, and then they go on to say how complex it is. It is called Dungeons and Dragons. Even more than all the cartoons, toys, comics, books, videos, and music, this simple little game has served to make our children a generation at risk. What is Dungeons and Dragons? It's Christmas morning. Brimming with excitement, Junior opens his first gift, a basic Dungeons and Dragons set. Inside he finds a rule book, some graph paper, an odd set of dice. No game board, no little men to move around. He checks the, ra the wrapping paper for missing pieces, then begins to open the other packaging, hoping to find the rest of his game. Who's going to buy a kid who's never heard of Dungeons & Dragons? A D&D &D basic box set. That never happened to my knowledge. You really had to go out and hunt Dungeons & Dragons down. I don't think anybody just randomly got it at Christmas and... Oh, now I'll worship the devil. Um, but Granddaddy has, uh, but Junior has 
All he needs to play Dungeons and Dragons, the granddaddy of the fantasy role-playing games, FRPs, and one of the fastest selling games in the United States. The game you see doesn't take place on a board, instead you play in your head. In D&D, the basic rule is, use your imagination, stretch it to the limit. Game boards and little men can be so confining. Well, again, their language is spot on. This is how role-playing works. It's your imagination. You know, if you can see it, you can be limited by it. But if it's in your imagination, the special effects are better than anything can be done. That's one of the problems with virtual tabletops these days, is that they limit everything down rather than being a story of your imagination. There are rules, of course, thousands and thousands of them. Now let's refer back to the previous page where it's a simple little game. <laughs> um, the whole point of an FRP is to play a character whose actions are dictated by your imagination, not by the rules. Like drama without a script, D&D is so complicated that we can give only the barest description of how the game is played. Before the game begins, each player must define his character. A roll of the dice determines the character's basic personality. Seven areas are rated. Strength, intelligence, wisdom, dexterity, constitution, comeliness, and charisma. Well, I believe they're talking about other games than Dungeons & Dragons. I don't remember comeliness being in one of the box sets. I could be wrong, perhaps one of the earlier editions, before I even started playing way back in the 70s but it doesn't sound familiar to me. Another roll of the dice decides each character's age, diseases, parasitic infestations, and special skills. Now, this is way outside anything I've ever seen. What version of Dungeon Dragons where you're rolling random up parasitic infections or infestations? What diseases did your character have? This sounds like we're getting into the World of Darkness sort of things of how doomed is your character. Oh, well, my character's got a terrible disease and he'll be dead in a week. Um, next, the player selects his character's race and class. If he wants to be a non-human, there are several races to choose from. Dwarf, Elf, Gnome, Half-Elf, Halfling, Half-Og. half or I think it's supposed to be Half-Orc. Each race in turn is divided into several classes, such as clerics, fighters, magic users, and thieves. Well, this is obviously Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Basic Dungeons & Dragons, the box set that he mentions that Little Junior was getting. The classes included the races. So you could play a Dwarf or an Elf, but you couldn't play a, a Dwarf Fighter. Because a Fighter was a human character class, a Fighting Man, going way back to the originals. So they are mixing up additions here. But they're not experts, even though they claim in the intro to have been advised by Dungeon Masters, who are experts. Um, a player chooses his character class according to the character's strengths. A character with high strength rating and low intelligence might be a fighter. An intelligent character would be a good magic user or cleric. Then the character rolls dice to determine hit points, the damage his character can suffer without dying. The higher the roll, the better his chance of surviving a melee. This is all good stuff. It's explained the game pretty well. As I commented, there's some mistakes and mixing up of additions. But they've done their research. These are smart guys. These are above the class of the pat-pulling uh, leaflet we saw and the very religious uh, one we saw a few weeks ago as well. This is a better standard of research and far better representing the hobby. Will that continue? Um... Each character is given a certain amount of gold to buy equipment for his adventure. Different sorts of characters use different equipment. A cleric purchases holy water, a fighter needs heavy weapons, a thief can obtain a prepackaged set of thievery tools. Finally, the characters choose their character's alignment from three basic possibilities. Law, chaos, and neutral. Lawful characters value order, organization, and the group. While those aligned with chaos value freedom, spontaneity, and the individual. Each alignment includes good and evil characters. The good characters operate in terms of creature rights, while evil characters have no regard for their fellows. The uh, character's alignment might be chaotic good, chaotic evil, lawful good, lawful evil, neutral evil. Missing out neutral, you know, being chaotic neutral, etc. Kind of skips over that. Um, Dungeon Master is the most important player, though he doesn't really play the game at all. DM is an experienced player who draws up the game board, a complex dungeon map that is different in every game. He populates the dungeon with monsters selected from the rulebook. On a DM sees the map at the beginning of the game, he directs the players through the maze, telling them when they meet a monster, what kind of monster it is, and their chances of killing it. The outcome of the battle is determined by dice roll. The players draw maps as they go, they enter the dungeon and battle the monsters, seeking treasure and trying to survive. Again, a very good description of it. 10 out of 10. Like conventional games, there is no... Uh, unlike conventional games, sorry, there's no real end to D&D. A typical session can last 4 to 12 hours. 
bit long, although I do remember my youth playing for 12-hour sessions. Games continue for years if the players are skillful enough to survive battles. As they conquer various monsters, in fact, they gain experience points and become more powerful and better equipped for battle. There aren't winners or losers in any conventional sense, only a series of adventures that finally come to an end when a character dies. Well, your campaign continues beyond that because you might play a new character within that campaign. The genesis of the game. Well, oh, Dungeons & Dragons was invented by Gary Gygax, an enthusiast of historical war games that gained a cult following in the 50s and 60s. Gygax combined the war game idea by, with medieval imagery and magic to make D&D. Spurned by the major game companies, Gygax invested £1,000 to form TSR Hobbit in 1973. Brian Bloom invested 2000 more in 74, and the two began printing rule books. At first, sales were low. First 1,000 games took a year to sell. The game gained popularity in the following year, especially amongst college students. In 75, TSR was incorporated, Gax and Bloom began working full-time. They published revised and advanced rulebooks and began to produce other fancy role-playing games. By 77, sales were up to over half a million dollars and nearly a dozen employees have been added to payroll. Sounds like a commercial success. To be commended, surely. It was not until 1979 that D&D gained na nationwide attention. In that year, Michigan State University student Dame James Dallas Egbert, a 16-year-old mathematical genius, disappeared, apparently while playing a realistic form of D&D in the maze of steam tunnels underneath the university's campus. Egbert was found but committed suicide a year later. His disappearance and his obsession with D&D, along with it, came front-page news in many major periodicals. Though the media assessments of the game were negative, the publicity paid huge dividends. Dana Lombardi, a columnist for Model Retailer, says TSR should raise a foundation to this Igbert kid. Except for the disappearance of that boy and the following national exposure, TSR could have remained a steadily growing hobby game company instead of a skyrocketing one. Gygax agrees. Ultimately, it was immeasurably helpful us in name recognition. We ran out of stock. Um, I don't know what that says. Surely companies take advantage of being newsworthy. Um... The numbers confirm this assessment. Sales exploded from 2.3 million in 1979 to 8.7 million in 1980. Um, I'll skip through more figures about that. Again, continues to be popular among older students, even at Christian colleges and seminaries. TSR also diversified. Uh, new FRPs were created with Warlocks and Warriors, Knights of Camelot, Top Secret, Boot Hill, and Gamma World. Um, TSR published a monthly magazine, The Dragon, and the Endless Quest book series, which are the Choose Your Own Adventure ones. Um, a movie, Dungeon Master, appeared a few years back, and a number of Saturday morning cartoons have been developed for both network and cable broadcasting. Well, I can't think of numerous role-playing based Saturday morning cartoons unless you continue, consider individual episodes of the Dungeon Dragons cartoon, because it was really the only one. Um, but the movie Dungeon Master, I find a very hilarious addition here. Because Dungeon Master has nothing to do with role-playing. It's about a computer programmer who gets drawn into a virtual universe of video game type stuff. It has nothing to do with role-playing games at all. Dungeon Master is just its title. It has nothing at all to do with um, fantasy role-playing, Dungeon Dragons, none of that. But they've just jumped on the title. They've not done any research at all. Their quality is going down already. Good start, starting to lose points. While TSR, far the biggest, um, sorry, far largest company producing FRPs, accounted for nearly half the total industry sales. Well, Wizards of the Coast have gone on with that today. I think they still account for about 60% of the market. There are about 400 FRPs now on the market. That seems high. I can believe it, but it's really stretching the definition, I would think. Um, we've got Tunnels and Trolls, Chivalry, uh, Sorcery, RuneQuest, Arden Grimoire. All in all, it's been estimated about a quarter of a million to 300,000 FRPs have been sold. Motives of FRPs are reinforced by other aspects of youth culture. Saturday morning cartoons feature the Masters of the Universe, muscle-bound barbarians living in the world of magicians, witches, and sorcerers. You get Masters of the Universe dolls, bo balls, comic books, and videos. There's even a feminist version, She-Ra, Princess of Power. And then there are the Smurfs and Care Bears, cute and cuddly, but born out of the same mentality. So, the Smurfs are something to do with Dungeons & Dragons? They're really stretching 
they are losing points value. After 10 out of 10 start, they're coming middling now. 5 out of 10. Since 1980, D&D and its imitators have entered the mainstream of American life. Public schools use D&D to teach reading and math skills. Absolutely fantastic ideas. Highly intelligent students are particularly attracted by the complexity and excitement. Thought it was a simple little game. Um, and D&D is often used in classes of gifted children. In Herba City, Utah, parental objections to D&D in the public school presumed pressured the school board to discontinue its use. A Boy Scout post in Chattanooga uses D&D, and the game has been advertised in Boy's Life, the official Scout magazine. Some Catholic schools are using D&D. Public libraries open their doors for training and game sessions. All sounds very positive. The moral dilemma. So why all the fuss? D&D sounds like a challenging, exciting new way to spend an evening. Yes, it does. Well, not new nowadays. We've got 40 years of history, but then, yeah, sure. It must be educational because they wouldn't use it in public schools, right? Even the Boy Scouts use it. And in the face of all this support, it seems most un-Americans suggest that there are serious deficiencies within the game. Well, you can point out deficiencies, but I, I don't know what un-American means. Anti-capitalist, maybe? There are serious defects, very serious. In spite of the favourable financial results of the Egbert case, the eerie course of events cast a shadow of the entire industry. Remember the freeway killer Vernon Butts, who committed suicide in his jail cell in 1981 while being held as a suspect in a string of murders? Right. Looking up freeway killer, I can't remember the names, but Vernon Butts was one of the people accused. Somebody else was put to death for those crimes, and Vernon Butts had been arrested and was giving evidence against them in jail, and then was killed because they let the actual murderer visit him in his cell. So what Vernon Butts having anything to do with Dungeons & Dragons has, you know, it makes you honest and willing to turn evidence on murderers. This doesn't sound like a terribly bad thing to be instilling into people. But maybe that wasn't known, because that happened in 1981, and this was written in five years later in 1986. Okay. Um, Butts was an avid D&D player who communicated with visitors using code developed as part of his D&D involvement. Another isolated instantly, not hardly. Well, we know the story of Dallas Egbert III, that he did not have anything to do with D&D in his disappearance. It's the fact that he felt under pressure because he was 16-year-old, sent off to university, and coming out as gay. So he ran away. It was nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> Um, this Vernon Butts case seems to have nothing to do with Dungeons and Dragons at all, since somebody else did the murders, not him. And then they murdered him. So he was a victim. Um, of course, not everyone who plays the game becomes suicidal or homicidal. Still, there are an awful lot of unsettling things going on here. Well, you've named two which have nothing to do with it. Could we have one case? Citation needed. Um... Uh, one of the chief defences of FRP is they simulate, stimulate the imagination. This is undeniably true. The question is, we want our imagination or that of our children stimulated in this particular way. Consider, for example, the level of violence and crime in a typical D&D game. One psychologist wrote, there is hardly a game in which the players do not indulge in murder, arson, torture, rape, or highway robbery. And he likes the game. The Dungeon Master's Guide lists Hitler amongst those historical characters who exhibited true D&D charisma. Well, that's true as far as I know, and it was a bad choice. Um, it gets worse because the violence in D&D is generally less graphic than some of its imitator. Consider some of these characters from the Monster Manual. Harpy. Harpies attack, torture, and devour their charmed prey. That's why you fight harpies. They're bad. Lizardmen. They're omnivorous, and they likely to prefer human flesh to other foods. They're the bad guys. You are fighting the bad guys. <laughs> You're not supposed to be playing a harpy or a lizardman. Um, the critical hit, hit tables from Arduin Grandma, which we had before. You know, hit location, crotch, chest, genitals, and breast, torn off, shock. As one 18-year-old player put it, these are the games where you get to kill people and get away with it. Um, I dread to think what he thought when video games turned up and you could load up Call of Duty and gun down hundreds of Nazis. Um, I put up a video about playing one of the Far Cry games, and by the end of it, I'd killed over a thousand of the enemy. <laughs> Um, 
Much of the violence is sexual oriented. No. Nope. Cover of the uh, Eldritch Wizardry supplement to D&D. Pictures a nude woman lying across a sacrificial altar. Sadomachism is legislated amongst insanities. Insanities are bad things. Non-violent sexual references also abound. Male characters also often attempt to seduce female characters. Well, you can do anything you want, so you can slap them around the face with a haddock if you want. One of the minor, minor malevolent effects is satiresis, defined as the excessive or normal, abnormal sexual craving in the male. Herbal remedies for venereal diseases are provided in the rule book. Um, those who profit the game are quick to defend the, the emphasis on sex violence and sexual preference. Dave Hargreave, creator of Ardo and Grimmar, says it was his game. And it's the same quote he, we've seen before in one of these, where he's talking about he made it deliberately bad because he thinks kids watch too much violence and don't think it's real enough. They get... Um, separated from violence and the effect and they think that a, he thought that a violent role playing game would hammer into them that these actions have repercussions um, carrying on through the game of power it talks about how um, people get hooked in they are they're attracted to Merlin the magician in King Arthur's court a frustrated writer admitted that he experienced an incredible sense of power as a dungeon master in some games they don't call me dungeon master they call me god I have never played in a game. I've been playing D&D for coming up to 40 years and never had a games master going, call me God. Um, fantasy power is a strong attraction. Um, talks about people who are attracted to it. But, interestingly enough, he they approach it in an interesting way here. Sorry. Um, the more I play, the more I want to get away from this world. Well, we've seen that quote before, and I commented there, that's talking about how bad this world is for youths and how much they would much rather escape into a fantasy world. That's more onto us to make the more world more acceptable. And they do accept that. No doubt, D&D did not create John's disillusionment, but it provided an outlet for the full expression of his autonomy and rebellion. In a very dramatic way, D&D reinforced John's hatred for life as ordered and given by God. Well... Whatever you say about the religious part, I think the rest is very true. Um, the guy who was playing the game and wanted to escape from it, it's not because D&D made him hate the real world. He hated the real world already and wanted to escape from it, and that was just an outlet. Um, make the world better rather than make games worse, as I think I said before. Obsessive escapism of this sort is virtually equivalent to schizophrenia, and it talks through its accusations at that. Um, it's also talking about how magic is common so the bible talks about all magic being bad so you being a wizard in a story is bad but they approach that very later um, I'll skip on for a few pages because there's too much to carry on going we're already what at 23 minutes I'm only at page 9 or sorry page 14 out of 24 Um Talks about things here, you know, the 666 layers of the demonic abyss. Beelzebub is listed in an archdemon. Um, at the very least, anyone familiar with fancy role-playing books is learning the terminology of witchcraft and satanism. Well, surely that's reading the Bible as well. Because surely all these things are in the Bible. Um, we've got Dr. Gary North's famous quote here that we've used and um, without any doubt in his mind after years of study... Um, I can say with confidence these games are the most effective, most magnificently packaged, most profitably marketed, most thoroughly researched introduction to a cult in man's recorded history, period. Said by an economist. He is not a psychologist. He's not looking at this from any other part from he knows the game's making money. D&D um, &D has become a modern-day um, catechism which I thought was a, the question response, which the whole thing's supposed to be. How should a Christian respond to such games? And it approaches through, well, you shouldn't be taking part in magic witchcraft or anything. You shouldn't be becoming too obsessed by your characters. Um, even if you're playing good characters, you shouldn't be losing yourself in it. And I kind of agree with that. 
Um, a game is to be played, it's not to be obsessed over. Um, scripture expressly forbids tampering with magic and witchcraft, divination, human sacrifice, and many of the other common elements. Well, one of the things I find absolutely hilarious is this next paragraph. In defending FRPs, many people have pointed out the obvious fact that most fairy tales, the Brothers Grimm, J.R. Tolkien, or C.S. Lewis, are full of witches, goblins, or sorcerers. But the heroes of these stories aren't the witches and sorcerers. Not read Lord of the Rings, then. Not heard of Gandalf. Whoops! One of the main heroes of Lord of the Rings, J.R. Tolkien, is a wizard using magic. <laughs> Again... They started off so well, they reason out things, but their research is pretty poor, as always. I would have thought that one of the dungeon masters that they consulted would have known that there's a guy called Gandalf who's a wizard and a hero in Lord of the Rings. How should we play? Well, it talks about how play is actually built into God's plan. That that's why he gave people the um, Sabbath day. You know, you've got a day of rest to play and relax. You work six days, you play one day, you relax. So, it's very biblical. You know, games aren't a bad thing. But, it talks about how this is bad because you are taking on bad elements. And, carrying on through, we've got mention of how it's like acting. Uh, if I can find the exact section. I think I've skipped on too far. But it talks about acting. You know, how if an actor is playing the part of a murderer, um, John Wayne Gacy, then that's fine. Because they are not obsessing about making the murderer the hero. So... They are splitting hairs here. It's all right to play a murderer in acting, but it's not okay to play a hero who kills in role-playing games for some reason, because the heroic actions of killing are the centre of the story. They really spend a lot of pages, which is why I'm skipping over these last few pages, splitting hairs. They're going right through how... Well, we allow all these other things, but Dungeons & Dragons and role-playing games are different for these reasons. Now, as I've said a few times, these writers are skilled in what they're doing. They're making good arguments, but they've got no strength to them. Now, why, apart from some very tenuous reasons, is role-playing different to acting? Why can you be an actor and play an evil character but you can't play an evil character in a role-playing game. There's just some very tenuous stuff about not obsessing and glorifying the violence. Which I can kind of see. I think we talk about that in movies a fair amount. You know, movies which absolutely glorify violence are seen as a bit silly. We went through that phase in the 80s of the big blockbuster hero movies. You know, Rambo and all that, where it totally glorifies warfare without anybody suffering any bad effects from it. And we kind of look them as a bit silly and childish now. Ridiculous. And I can see you making an argument for role-playing games being somewhat like that if you're obsessing over the combat. If you're just dealing with death all the time without suffering any repercussions. But I have to say that when I'm dungeon mastering, I do make sure there's repercussions there. Usually, the players are the repercussion for evil characters doing evil stuff, so they meet heroes and they suffer for their actions. But, I've talked about it before, when I was running a game at the local community centre for kids, they went totally off the rails and they slaughtered a village. Had I made sure there were repercussions to that? And those consequences came in almost straight away. So, clerics from the local area were brought in to speak with dead. So the dead villagers grasped in these crimes that the players had committed. Other heroes in the area were informed that there was a rampaging mob uh, who had slaughtered a village. So the players had to flee the area. There were consequences. And that's what the game was about. They did something and there were consequences for that. 
And in, as I said, in your heroic games, the players are usually the consequences. So the orcs kill um, a village, and they've done a bad act, and the heroes have to hunt down the orcs. They are the consequences for the orcs' even action. But, going back to the booklet, it carries on through. Um, thankfully, as parents, we can provide our children with wholesome alternatives. We can protect them from strangely magnetic allure of the dungeon. We can win the war for their hearts and minds and souls. If only we would. Because it ends on a very interesting note. The last few paragraphs talk about how you shouldn't just tell your children no. You should explain why you think it's a bad idea. You're supposed to be educating your children. And that's a very high note to end on. And I'm very impressed by the way they do that. Um, at the back, there's further reading. Um, an advert for Dr. Gary North's Unholy Spirits book. And that's it. Now, I found this a very interesting piece of satanic panic propaganda. Because it is so much more well thought out than the others. It's not just shouting them out it. They've done some research, even though they are terribly wrong in certain areas. They should have done far more research. But they've thought about this, and they've come up with conclusions and solutions. You know, educating your children into not doing the things you don't like. Explaining why you think it's bad ideas. Top notch. This, if it had been far more common, would have been a good piece to distribute to Christians to explain why you thought Dungeon Dragons was bad. It makes some wrong conclusions, but it's well argued. Anyway, as usual, I think I've witted on for quite long enough, so thank you very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.